The man who opened up more of the world's surface than anyone else in history owed his success to a burning faith, a medicine chest, and unfailing good manners. Wherever Dr. David Livingstone travelled in unexplored Africa, he always treated the Africans with courtesy, even the witch doctors, whom he called his professional brothers. It was only by chance that Livingstone ever came to Africa. Born in 1813, in Blantyre near Glasgow, he was sent to work in a local spinning mill at the age of 10. By working 12 hours a day, he paid his way through medical school in Glasgow to become a doctor missionary in China. But his hopes were dashed by the Opium Wars, which made it impossible for him to work in China. In 1840, at the age of 27, he decided to go to Africa instead. In the 19th century, most of the 12 million square miles of Africa were still totally unknown to the Western civilizations. It was a dark continent, the place of impenetrable jungle, of ferocious animals and disease. Livingstone did not go to Africa to explore. The habit grew on him. At first he travelled only to establish his Christian missions and to bring medical assistance to those in need, but as the years went by he was gripped by wanderlust. On foot, by canoe and sometimes on oxback, he travelled thousands of miles from the Atlantic to the Indian Ocean through territories that are now South Africa, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Zaire, Angola, Mozambique, Tanzania, Rwanda and Burundi. With him he always carried a Bible a magic lantern, a compass, and a sextant. He had learnt to use a sextant in Cape Town, but he never failed to record his precise location each day. Nor were his journeys those of a man whose sole purpose was to spread the gospel. He charted all the regions he visited, making detailed and intelligent observations of the natural life, geography, geology, and medical cases he witnessed. These painstaking reports he sent to the Royal Geographical Society in London as much a man of God, he was a man of science. Nevertheless, it was the Christian faith that drove Livingston on, fighting superstition and cruelty, establishing churches and schools, and teaching elementary hygiene and sanitation. He could survive where others had perished, because in the first place he had sufficient medical knowledge to keep himself alive in malaria-infested regions. With his penetrating mind, he once noted, myriads of mosquitoes showed, as they probably always do, the presence of malaria. He did not reach the conclusion that mosquitoes cause malaria, but at least he invented an anti-malarial pill of jalap and quinine in which he managed to survive his own bouts of the disease. Secondly, unlike so many other white travellers, he journeyed among people for whom he felt compassion and respect, people who admired and respected him in return, not only as a doctor who helped them, but as a man. Above all, as soon as he became aware of the horrors of the slave trade run by the Arabs, he resolved to fight slavery as long as he should live. Livingstone married the daughter of a fellow missionary, and they had six children. When his baby daughter died on a journey in 1850, Livingstone sent his family home to Britain, but he stayed in Africa with the wider family of his African peoples. In 1856, he returned to London and found himself a national hero. He could easily have rested on his laurels, but that was not for him. Soon he went back to his beloved Africa. Then, in 1866, he started out from Zanzibar on a quest for the Royal Geographical Society to track down the source of the River Nile. This time everything went wrong. His bearers fell ill, his oxen died, and many of his servants ran away rather than face the warlike tribes that are now Tanzania, Rwanda and Burundi. Livingstone himself suffered agonies from several diseases, malaria, ulcers and rheumatic fever. Then came the bitterest blow of all. Two more servants ran off, taking with them his medicine chest and quinine. His supplies exhausted, and with almost no hope left, his little party lay up in the village of Uji, on the eastern shore of Lake Tanganyika. Meanwhile, the civilised world was wondering what could have happened to the celebrated Dr Livingstone. Rumours abounded, but nobody knew if he was alive or dead. Nearly five years after his disappearance, the New York Herald decided to send its leading reporter, Henry Morton Stanley, to search for the great doctor. Stanley himself was a remarkable character, a penniless Welsh waif. He had shipped to New Orleans as a cabin boy, then drifted into journalism, and had become one of the greatest reporters in the United States. In 1871, 
At the head of an expedition of 192 men, Stanley set off from Zanzibar, pushing through the wild country of East Africa and following up all rumours of the missing White Doctor. The search lasted for eight months. On November the 10th, 1871, his party reached Uji village. There, standing in a clearing before his tent, Stanley saw the emaciated figure of the explorer, staring in astonishment at the search party that had come so far to his rescue. The meeting between the two men has since become legendary and something of a music hall joke. Much speculation has taken place as to what was actually said at the time, but perhaps some of the controversy is cleared through Stanley's note in his autobiography. He wrote, I walked up to him and doffing my helmet, bowed and said in an inquiring tone, Dr. Livingstone, I presume. Smiling cordially, he lifted his cap and answered briefly, yes. This ending or scepticism on my part, my face betrayed the earnestness of my satisfaction as I extended my hand and added, I thank God, Doctor, that I have been permitted to see you. In the warm grasp he gave my hand and the heartiness of his voice, I felt that he also was sincere and earnest as he replied, I feel most thankful that I am here to welcome you. Stanley's rescue came none too soon, for Livingstone had been without medicine for two years and was very ill. Nevertheless, he refused Stanley's invitation to return for the certain triumph that awaited him in London. I still have much work to do, he said. So Stanley turned back, and Livingstone, now supplied with medicine, equipment and servants, pressed ahead in his search for the Nile. But he was a dying man. In the coming months, he found the headwaters of the river, the Congo, and not the Nile. He was never to know his error. At Chichambo village on the morning of May the 1st, 1873, his bearers found him kneeling by his bedside, in an attitude of prayer, his head resting on his hands. They could not rouse him. From village to village, the message was spread. His converts came in their thousands to pay their last respects. They knew that far away in Britain, the doctor's friends would want his body for burial, so they embalmed it. But first they moved his heart and buried it where it belonged, in the soil of Africa. Then began a funeral march that took nine months to reach Zanzibar. The remains borne across the wild lands by relays of Africans chanted the hymns that Livingstone had taught them. From Zanzibar, a British steamer brought the body home, where it was laid to rest in Westminster Abbey.